Chapter Six, Bretton Woods: The Plan That Might Have Made It, 1944. The year 1944 marked a crucial transition in the history of the international monetary system. July of that year saw delegates converging on Bretton Woods from 44 countries that were beginning to see signs of an Allied victory bringing the war to an end, in the not too distant future. Weighing on their shoulders, and indeed on those of the whole world, were not only five years of war, but also ten years of equally worldwide depression, plus another ten years of speculative and inflationary excesses and turmoil generated in turn by the contradictions that had emerged in the wake of the First World War. The stakes were dauntingly high. The mistakes made at the end of the First World War were to be avoided at all costs. The curtain was to be brought down on thirty years of hostility and purblind nationalism, also at the economic level, and the foundations were to be laid for the rebuilding of international trade, so as to usher in a new age, one of peace and prosperity, comparable with the image still cherished by all, that of the thirty-year period preceding the assassination at Sarajevo. The response proved as historic as the task ahead. The Bretton Woods Conference was the first and, so far, the only occasion when the rules for international payments were expressly agreed upon and established by common consent. As we've seen in the foregoing chapters, the results fell short of the noble ambitions. The Bretton Woods system was to last a mere twenty-five years, from the Savannah Conference of 1946, which ratified the agreements, to the speech delivered by Nixon in 1971. Which effectively brought them to an end, but not even those twenty-five years ever saw the system fully in force. The fundamental rule of convertibility was at last adopted by most of the countries only when, and thanks to the fact that another fundamental rule, providing for controls over capital, was effectively bypassed, with the emergence of the euro-dollar market. Nevertheless, those were at least twenty-five years of prosperity. If not of peace, now not only regretted as a sort of second Belle Epoque, but actually stretched out into the glorious thirty. Historians concur, however, in attributing the economic growth of this period to the financial flows running outside the Bretton Woods system along the channels mapped out in the two preceding chapters, far more than to the financing mobilized by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Precisely, the institutions designated at Bretton Woods, with the purpose of promoting reconstruction and the revival of trade. The aims of the new system were set in the first article of the agreement in these precise terms: to facilitate the expansion and growth of international trade, to promote exchange stability, and lessen the degree of disequilibrium in the international balances of payments of members. And yet, the path effectively taken on a global scale over the following years—that of bypassing the rules laid down by the agreements through massive capital movements denominated in dollars—did in fact lead to the objective of growth, but at the expense of the other objectives. Over the same period, the European Payments Union testified to the possibility of supporting the free expansion of international trade by radically different means. Thanks to which it was feasible not only to maintain the convertibility of exchange rates together with the equilibrium in the balances of payments, but also to achieve these two objectives, starting out from a situation of market instability and disequilibrium. One cannot help wondering whether it wouldn't have been possible to devise a system of regulations on the model of the European Union of Payments, but permanently and on a worldwide scale. Thereby avoiding the need to resort to that source of liquidity and of disequilibria opened up through the adoption of the dollar as international currency. Actually, a system of the sort not only could have been devised, but effectively was devised with the precise purpose of drawing up the economic rules in the post-war years. This was the International Clearing Union, engineered by Keynes on behalf of the British government. In the course of the bilateral negotiations with the United States that began in 1942, and culminated with the Bretton Woods Conference.
As we know, it was, however, the American plan that found its way into the final text of the agreements. We also know the reason customarily invoked to explain why this was so. At the end of the war, the United States was so powerful as to be able to bring its own interests to prevail, not only over the countries that were eventually defeated, but also over the countries that, thanks to US intervention alone, had emerged victorious. And yet, in the light of the course of events that followed, we cannot but wonder whether the American policy was long-sighted enough to be able to weigh up the country's real interests. In 1947, US unilateralism might have been worth the $4 billion a year of the Marshall Plan, but over 60 years later, is it still worth America's $800 billion a year current account deficit? Or had such a price actually been anticipated? Keynes's plan merits re-evaluation, not by the yardstick of British interests, but in the prospect also of America's real advantage. It was in fact in the interests of the United States that Keynes urged the need for a clearing system. Only with a system conceived in these terms would it be possible to answer to the interests of both the creditor and debtor countries, setting in motion a mechanism that would literally bring them to converge towards a common position of equilibrium. Before examining this mechanism in detail, it's worth rereading the passage quoted in Part 1, where Keynes describes its advantages. Quote, a country finding itself in a creditor position against the rest of the world as a whole should enter into an obligation to dispose of this credit balance and not to allow it, meanwhile, to exercise a contractionist pressure against the world economy and, by repercussion, against the economy of the creditor country itself. This would give, and all others, the great assistance of multilateral clearing. This is not a Red Cross philanthropic relief scheme by which the rich countries come to the rescue of the poor, it is a piece of highly necessary business mechanism which is at least as useful to the creditor as to the debtor. According to Keynes, the international payment system should be constructed in such a way that the international creditor position of one country, that is, a credit, be bound together with an obligation, literally, a debt. This debt consists in the duty incumbent on the creditor country to dispose of its credit, not allowing it to accumulate indefinitely, which would mean removing the means of trade from circulation with deflationary effects harmful to the whole system, and so, ultimately, to the creditor country itself. We might describe it as a matter of moral duty. In this sense, we use the term in the previous chapter. What the duty implies, in the first place, is not promoting good behaviour in respect of a given rule, but introducing a good rule, a rule that is drawn up in such a way as to render any legitimate choice made by a part compatible with the soundness and integrity of the whole. In fact, Keynes immediately went on to point out that the reference here to the creditor's debt had no implications in terms of individual morality. It was not a matter of appealing to the goodness of an individual creditor country, for example the United States, to agree to reduce its credit by any act of unilateral generosity, for example through an aid plan, inspired by some philanthropic or humanitarian aim, for example to defend freedom around the world. What was at stake was the institutional viability of the international monetary system as a whole, it was a matter of guaranteeing the soundness of the system or its capacity to bring the legitimate national interests of each country to converge with the common interests of international trade. To achieve this, the system was to be constructed in such a way that creditor countries would not expect to be thanked for lending but rather would have a concrete interest in doing so. But how could such a system be put together? Keynes's proposal revolved around the institution that gave its name to the plan, the International Clearing Union. It was conceived of as a clearinghouse, much like the European Payments Union, but on a global scale. Each member country was to hold an account with the clearing union that would be denominated in an international unit of account, instituted for the purpose and called 
Bangkok. The national currency of each member country was to have its parity fixed in terms of the Bangkok. The initial balance of each account was to stand at zero. Every commercial transaction was to be recorded with double entry. Credit would be entered on the side of the exporting country, while the corresponding debit would be recorded for the importing country. But this was not to be a bilateral debit-credit relationship between the two countries. In fact, both debit and credit fell to the clearing union as a whole. This meant that the exporting country could use its credit to pay for imports at any time and from any other member country, while the importer could pay its debts with the proceeds from exports made at any time to any other member. Thus, the clearing union would provide for continuous, multilateral, and intertemporal clearing of credit, exports, and debit imports. For each country. The balance would always correspond to its net overall balance of trade, positive in the case of surplus, negative in the case of deficit, while the balance of the clearing union as a whole would always remain at zero. For this reason, the clearing union has, in principle, no need of any initial endowment of money in the form of a deposit, capital, or reserve. So far, however. There seems to be little to distinguish the clearing union from a bank. Indeed, in describing the system, Keynes made it quite clear that his source of inspiration lay in the mechanisms for the creation of bank money. Just like a bank, the clearing union created money at a simple stroke of a pen, offering advances that were not necessarily covered by the equivalent amount of deposits. Indeed, having no deposits or reserves in any form. The clearing union would supply credit without any monetary base, and it could be said to create money from nothing. This is why many critics denounced Keynes's proposal as inflationary. It is a charge that merits serious attention, not because it is well grounded, but because the many objections that can be raised against it bring to the fore as many characteristics peculiar to Keynes's plan. To begin with. It is well to clear the field of any idea that Keynes might have been ideologically in favour of inflation, regardless. That his recommendations were mainly of an expansive nature is unquestionable, but this was only because he was living in a period marked by deflation, which he set out to tackle by every means that might serve the purpose. Keynes waxed sarcastic against the dogmatism of those who made monetary rigour a matter of orthodoxy. Quote, to be sometimes in favour of dearer money and sometimes in favour of cheaper money seems to them like being sometimes a Protestant and sometimes a Roman Catholic. The line to be taken in monetary policy was, for Keynes, a practical choice that depended on the circumstances. In the years that saw him drawing up his plan for Bretton Woods, his main preoccupation was that money might be wanting after the war and not abounding. It was for this reason that, unlike Rueff, Keynes opposed any return to gold, no matter what form it might take. It was not an inflationary consideration that guided his plan, but an anti-deflationary one, which, moreover, he made perfectly clear. Quote, the plan aims at the substitution of an expansionist in place of a contractionist pressure on world trade. More precisely still, for Keynes, the purchasing power to be put at the disposal of trade was to be neither great nor little, but commensurate with the availability of goods to be traded at any given moment. Hence, in his project, he pegged the creation of international money on the commercial transactions effectively undertaken, which meant that the money Keynes had in mind was not created from nothing, but followed upon trade in goods. At the same time. And precisely for the same reason, the money created as bank or asset in favour of a country in surplus is, by the same token, destroyed whenever that country reduces its credit position by importing. In accordance with the definition Keynes had already provided twenty years before, the money created in the clearing union is a mere intermediary without significance in itself, which flows from one nation to another, is received and dispensed. And disappears when its work is done. 
from the accounts of the clearing union. If every country were to bring its balance of trade to equilibrium, then every balance would return to zero, the creation of money being entirely reabsorbed, having served solely to provide for the transfer of goods among all the participating countries, in other words, for an increase in real wealth. Within the clearing union, the balanced budget was not to be a merely ideal situation that could be departed from indefinitely by accumulating increasing credit and debit balances, as was feared by critics, who read an intrinsic inflationary bias into the proposal. On the contrary, the balanced budget was to be the concrete situation from which the members of the clearing union set out to begin with, and from which they could not depart beyond certain limits and to which, above all, they were constantly led back. The countries in deficit would certainly not be entitled to go on piling debt upon debt indefinitely, but they would have to contain the debt within the quota set for each country in proportion to the volume of its foreign trade. Moreover, within these limits, countries would also have an incentive to reduce their debit position, being subject to a charge proportional to their debt. With the clearing union, debts can be run up freely, but not free of charge, nor without limit, nor indeed for any purpose whatsoever. Nevertheless, the mechanisms we have so far described for the clearing union still resemble those of any commercial bank. Unlike a commercial bank, on the other hand, the clearing union still shows what appears to be a shortcoming, making provision for no form of reserve or guarantee. But what should the clearing union guarantee to its creditors? Unlike the depositors of a commercial bank, the creditor countries of the clearing union have no right to draw anything from their accounts. On the other hand, however, they have, been, they have made no deposits either. Their credit has matured within the clearing union through the trade that the latter has enabled them to perform, and in consequence of their decision to import less than they have exported. Moreover, the countries in surplus are free to make full use of their assets and can decide to spend them however they like and whenever they like. They come up against no restrictions to their purchasing power and they run no risk as long as there is something in the world to acquire. For all these reasons, there's no need to protect or compensate the creditor countries in any way. The need is rather to prevent them from carry on piling up their assets indefinitely thereby exerting contractive pressure on world trade. This, in fact, is why assets are subject to the same limitations and charges as apply to liabilities in the credit union. Credit and debit alike are subject to the same negative interest. In either case, interest is paid to the clearing union as a management charge. This symmetrical charge on debit and credit alike was actually the most original and significant feature of Keynes' entire plan. At the institutional and at the operational level, the charge was justified by the need to ensure that the aim of each country would converge with their collective goal, in other words, with the aim of the Union, which was to bring the balances towards equilibrium, in other words, towards clearing. If balance of payments equilibrium was in fact the sole economic criterion, then the countries in surplus would be in a position of disequilibrium no less than the countries in deficit, and, like them, should be led to correct it. This equal treatment of credits and liabilities is the only guarantee the clearing union needs. It is in fact a stronger guarantee than any reserve constraint that might apply to the creation of money through leverage and liquidity. In fact, thanks to the equal distribution of charges between creditors and debtors, all the money created in the clearing union, with a view to international trade, not only can, but indeed must, eventually be reabsorbed, bringing all the credit and debit balances back towards zero, thanks to further trading. Despite all the provisions we have so far described, the case could still arise in practice of a country persisting in balance of trade disequilibrium. To cope with this eventuality, should a country's deficit or surplus exceed a certain threshold for a certain period of time, then the rules of the clearing union would grant the country in question the faculty to adjust its exchange rate within a 5% limit. 
Thus, for example, a country showing a sizable chronic deficit would be able to devalue its currency against the bankor so as to regain competitiveness and bring its external accounts back to equilibrium without having to resort to deflationary measures, and thus with no prejudice to its internal equilibrium. In this way, thanks to the distinction between national and international currency, it would be possible to adjust the rate of exchange between the two, and with it, the ratio between the internal and external purchasing power of each currency. And given the possibility to adjust this ratio, equilibrium could in turn be pursued in the internal economy and in foreign trade at the same time, eliminating any contrast between the two objectives, which would thus prove compatible. Moreover, with the unequivocal definition of disequilibrium in external accounts, in terms of a significant and persistent departure from equilibrium, and with the precise measurement that could be made of this disequilibrium on the evidence of the clearing union accounts, there would be no risk of the arbitrary use of the scope for regulation offered by the system of adjustable exchange rates. On the strength of this consistent set of rules, the clearing union was conceived of as a financial instrument for international trade, eminently apt for the fundamental task required of credit, as defined in Part 1 namely to provide an advance against future payment. Having now looked into the essential mechanisms driving it, it's worth recapitulating at this point the implications of the clearing union for the fundamental components of the financial relationship as they emerged in Part 1. 1. The connection between advance and settlement. 2. The relations between the monetary functions. 3 the distinction between money and goods, and four, the connection between the national and international economy. 1. The Clearing Union is geared entirely and solely towards providing overdraft facilities for trade in goods between countries against future settlement. Balance of trade equilibrium is central to the Union as its starting point and constituent law. It is this rule that makes it into a clearing union. Literally, that is, a union for the balancing of all accounts, the clearing of all positions. In virtue of this role, the clearing union was to take on the form of an international economic space created to enable, according to Rueff's formula, the meeting of all the creditors with all the debtors. Precisely because it was to be made the governing principle of the clearing union, Balance of trade equilibrium could also be identified with the long-term tendential equilibrium seen not as the ex-post outcome of short period interactions, but rather as the horizon towards which they would be moving. For a system of regulations governed by the clearing union provisions, balance of trade equilibrium was to constitute a point that, in physical terms, could be defined stable and attractive. Within this system, each country's balance of trade, like a ball rolling about in a bowl, is inexorably drawn towards the central point of gravity. If this is in fact the case, then there can be clearly no question of attributing an intrinsic inflationary tendency to the clearing union. Inflation implies creating money in excess of the goods it can buy. In the clearing union, each country creates money whenever it sells goods to another country, but in the very act of creation it also undertakes to destroy it, acquiring goods from any other countries so as to bring its balance back to zero. Thus, far from being inflationary, the clearing union takes on the form of a system in which the quantity of money does not count. As Keynes himself put it, quote, the peculiar merit of the clearing union as a means of remedying a chronic shortage of international money is that it operates through the velocity rather than through the volume of circulation. The clearing union, if it were fully successful, would deal with the quantity of international money by making any significant quantity unnecessary. The same idea was reasserted by the British economist D. H. Robertson who answered to the Fed director's fears during the Anglo-American negotiations 
by pointing out how the tasks of monetary authority would change within the framework of the clearing union. Quote, it is arguable that the proudest day in the life of the manager of the clearing union would be that on which, as a result of the smooth functioning of the correctives set in motion by the plan, there were no holders of international money, on which he was able to show a balance sheet on both sides of the account. 2. Moreover, the clearing union was designed in such a way as to dispense with the supply of a quantity of money from the outset. It is enough to consider its architecture to see that there is clearly no need for any preventive allocation of money, of a fund, for advances in order to finance the temporary balance of payments deficits. It's not necessary to have money to provide credit, or in any case to have money in the form of a currency reserve. What is needed, rather, is an international unit of account corresponding in no way to any national currency for the denomination of the debits and credits generated by trading transactions between countries. Precisely for this reason, the fundamental mainstay of Keynes's proposal was the Bancor, i.e. international money of account, purely abstract, immaterial, or to use the terminology of a very old system to which we will be returning later, imaginary. The second mainstay is the overdraft facility, credit as pure and simple advance, not a loan of money previously allocated, but breathing space granted to importers so that they can, thanks to their imports, produce and export in turn. On the one hand, then, the credit granted by the clearing union to its member countries depends upon this money as international unit of account. On the other hand, however, the credit can be spent at any time and for any end and is therefore to all intents and purposes money in the sense of a means for international payment. Thus, the money created by the clearing union consisting of credit balances in bankors could be considered and used as a means for international trade, but not as a currency reserve, for it could not be conserved indefinitely. Ultimately, payment must be made with goods, and with goods alone. Anyone holding money in the form of credit balances and bankors is under the obligation to spend it. This money, therefore, given the rules that govern its functioning, incorporates the most fundamental characteristic of money, it is money made to be spent, bearing with it the constant reminder to those holding it that they must spend it, and thereby representing in concrete terms Keynes's idea of the creditor's debt. The country holding credit with the clearing union has a duty, not a right. In particular, it can claim no right of ownership, full and exclusive, over its credit balances and bankors. In this respect, in the clearing union, no one is owner of international liquidity. Anyone holding money in the clearing union would be at the mercy of his neighbours, as Keynes aptly put it in describing the peculiarity of money in a transcript note to the tract. The country holding bankors is in fact beholden to the other countries as a whole, depending on them to transform that credit into goods. 3. The Clearing Union project incorporates all the more or less explicit indications that can be drawn from Keynes's theoretical work, spanning the 25 years from his first publication on the faults of the monetary system as we know it, and on the characteristics of the money system as it ought to be. It is beyond our scope to trace out in detail the theoretical foundations of the Clearing Union in the corpus of Keynes's writings but there is at least one element worth mentioning here. In Chapter 17 of The General Theory, Keynes compares money and goods as alternative forms in which wealth can be held, pointing out that money enjoys an advantage in that holding it, unlike holding goods, entails no costs due to storage or deterioration. It is also on account of this advantage that money can take on the function of a store of value. It can in fact be withdrawn from circulation indefinitely, with consequent deflationary pressure on trade and production. To avoid this risk, 
Keynes went as far as to take into serious consideration the idea of introducing artificial carrying costs for money, to ensure that it can be spent and not withheld beyond the lapse of time required by trade. In the closing chapters of his major work, Keynes again raised the possibility of such a scheme as a decisive step towards exit from crisis, praising the heterodox economist Silvio Giselle, the first one to have devised and experimented with forms of stamped money. The costs borne by the clearing union creditors can be understood in the sense of a charge for holding wealth in the form of an international currency. Given these costs, the bankor is in fact money subject to artificial carrying costs, that is, money that cannot be held as a store of value. It has to be spent within a certain period of time, and insofar as it is not spent, it is destroyed. The unutilized credit balance of the creditor country diminishes periodically by a sum corresponding to the charge fixed by the clearing union. Thus, the international currency ceases to enjoy the dubious advantage of being non-perishable, and the country will prefer to acquire goods rather than go on accumulating trade surpluses indefinitely. Nevertheless, the bankor would still have an advantage over a stock of goods, the advantage of not being subject to variations in price and of being immediately transformable into any commodity. This particular advantage, which Keynes called liquidity, constitutes the second reason for preferring the currency to goods as a way of holding wealth. And this too, Keynes set out to avoid. The same years that saw him working on the proposal for the clearing union also saw Keynes airing a plan for the international stockpiling of raw materials and agricultural produce. The idea was to endow commodities with the liquidity they lack, exploiting them as a means of reserve that could even replace gold as the basis for the monetary system. The idea behind the two integrated plans was to encourage the holding of commodities rather than the accumulation of money, and the circulation of goods rather than of capital. This may have been the reason why Keynes placed less emphasis than the drafter of the American plan, H. D. White, on the expediency of bringing in restrictions on capital movements. His aim was not so much to bar capital movements, that is, movements of money as capital, liquidity, assets, store of value, as to make them less advantageous than the purchase of goods. 4. The institutions that Keynes projected for the post-war period were also specifically designed to make national and economic monetary policies as independent as they could possibly be of the exigencies of the external account. Here he seems explicitly to have come down in favour of one of the horns of Mundell's trilemma at the expense of the other two. For the sake of national autonomy, he was apparently ready to forego both fixed exchange rates and international capital movements. At this point, however, we have enough evidence to be able to see just what this renunciation meant and the particular form it took. Fixed exchange rates and capital movements are not ends in themselves. The former serve for international trade, ensuring firm standards of measurement. The latter serve for investments. Clearly, Keynes had no intention of limiting international trade or investments. In fact, he did not look to a flexible exchange rate system, but rather to one of fixed but adjustable rates. Departures from the fixed rates being justified precisely by the need to guarantee equilibrium in trade. Similarly, far from hampering international credit, his idea was to facilitate it, under the form of commercial credit, granted by the clearing union and under the form of foreign direct investments, monetary transfers being associated with the transfers of goods, consumption or capital. On the other hand, what the clearing union was decidedly closed to were portfolio investments, in other words, transfers of money as assets against negotiable securities.
All this seems to have been quite masterfully designed, and above all, designed to serve the purposes of all. So the question arising here, even more forcefully than before, is this. If the clearing union was such an expertly devised system, why wasn't it adopted at Bretton Woods?